this video, I'm going to show how to build an AM transmitter that can be heard on a regular handheld radio or in your car. To understand how to build an AM radio, first you need to understand how amplitude modulation works. You start off with a carrier wave, which is just high frequency alternating current running up and down a conductor. As electrons are accelerated, they release photons which travel outward as waves with a certain frequency. For this video, I'm using 1 MHz. The carrier wave by itself doesn't carry information, so if we want to send a signal, we'll have to superimpose it on top of the carrier wave to vary its strength over time, which results in a modulated carrier wave that's actually sending some information. In my case, I'm going to transmit a square wave, so my input signal would look like this, but the output of the transmitter would look like this. On the receiving end, the incoming waveform is chopped in half and the carrier frequency is filtered out, leaving behind only the signal. To actually build a radio to do this, we have to start with an oscillator that will generate our carrier frequency. The oscillator will have a very tiny current, so it needs an amplifier to bump it up to a more usable power, as well as cleaning up the output of it. At the same time, we're generating our signal. In this case, it's just going to be a simple 1 kHz tone, but this could also be an audio or video input. The main amplifier combines the signal and carrier to create a modulated carrier wave, increases the power to usable level, and transmits it out. In order to get the best efficiency we can, we have to add some circuit elements to match the impedance of the antenna. This is really important and I'll cover it in more detail later. Finally, the modulated carrier reaches the antenna and it radiates out into space. I'll start by building the carrier oscillator. This is a circuit called a Colpitz oscillator which bounces current around between an inductor and two capacitors, using this formula to determine the frequency. Plugging in the numbers in our circuit gives 1.03 MHz. The third capacitor here blocks DC from getting through, and the large value resistor provides some bias current to the transistor to get it started. The 22 ohm resistor between the emitter and ground stabilizes the oscillation. I found that I had to tinker with the values of the biasing and stabilizing resistor before I could get the circuit to oscillate. With everything working correctly, I should get a 1 MHz sine wave on the output, which is connected to the collector pin of the transistor. So here's the oscillator. An LM317 regulates the voltage down to about 9 volts because there can be slight frequency drift depending on the voltage. The inductor is 26 gauge magnet wire wound around a piece of a dowel. Let's connect it up to the scope and see what it does. Okay, that's exactly what I expected to see. The oscillator is working perfectly. This is good for a crude radio, but an LC oscillator isn't very stable compared to a crystal. For example, here I'm pinching the coil ever so slightly, and as I do so, you can see the frequency shift up and down on the scope. Now that I've got a working oscillator, I want to step up the drive current and convert that sine wave of a few microamps into a square wave with several milliamps to drive the main amplifier. To do this, I'm going to use some transistors to clip the top and bottom curves of the sine wave to make it more square. A bipolar junction transistor outputs current proportional to the base current multiplied by the transistor's gain. For this example, let's say we've got 10 microamps of base current and a gain of 100. This gives us 1 milliamp flowing out of the transistor's collector. Even if the collector is shorted to ground, we'll still have only 1 milliamp flowing. However, at a certain point, the resistance becomes the limiting factor for collector current. For this example, let's say VCC is 10 volts. Voltage across our resistor is then the current times the resistance. At 10 volts, we can flow 1 milliamp through as much as 10 kilo ohms of resistance. Any resistance beyond that will reduce the collector current. When that happens, the output waveform is truncated or clipped. Here are some examples of the voltage waveform you'd see with different resistances. The current is constant below 10 kilo ohms. However, once we hit 20 kilo ohms, the upper side of the waveform gets clipped because the resistor is limiting below what the transistor is providing. If I add another stage to this clipping circuit, but with an NPN transistor instead of a PNP, I can clip the bottom half of the sine wave. At this point, I've closely approximated a square wave, and in the process, I've also amplified the current coming from the oscillator, which will allow me to drive more current through the main amplifier. So here's the board with the clipping filter added, and we'll take a look at it on the scope. Not a perfectly square wave, but pretty close. The rounding might be from junction capacitance in the transistors. This will work fine though. I was starting to run out of room on my perf board, so I had to glue another one on before I could continue building. The audio tone generation is pretty straightforward. 
I used the 555 timer to generate a 1 kHz square wave. The frequency of the tone could be adjusted by changing either the discharge capacitor here or the charging resistors here. And here's how it looks on the board. For the main amplifier, I'm going to use a push-pull configuration to drive the antenna. The antenna is represented here as a capacitive load. A push-pull amplifier has a high side switch for charging and a low side switch for discharging, in this case a PNP and an NPN transistor. The switches take turns in the on state, and in theory, they should never be conducting at the same time, although in reality, there is a little bit of overlap. The amplifier is driven by the oscillator, so the switching happens at the carrier frequency. This back and forth cycle continues until it's interrupted by the 1 kHz tone. When the 1 kHz square wave from my 555 timer goes high, it energizes a transistor that pulls down the amplifier input, shutting it off. When the square wave goes low, the transistor shuts off and the amplifier goes back to normal operation. This is how amplitude modulation is achieved. This particular case would be better described as on-off keying, which is even more basic than amplitude modulation, but the amplifier input current could just as easily be adjusted by an analog input like an audio source. So here's the amplifier on the board. For a really simple antenna to test it out, I've just added an 8-inch piece of 20-gauge wire. I've also added a little push button in series with the 555 timer output so that I can manually key the transmitter. Now for a look on the scope. We can see our 1 MHz carrier wave on the amplifier, but if I zoom out, I can also see the modulation, which is basically just keying the carrier wave on and off a thousand times per second. Now for an actual transmit test. So the transmitter definitely works, but I'm only getting about 2 to 3 feet of range from it. I know that I'm tuned into the exact frequency I'm transmitting on, so why is my range so bad? You might look at this and think the solution is just to push more power into the transmitter, but that's not the answer. Like I mentioned before, a monopole antenna acts like a capacitor relative to earth ground, getting charged and discharged at the frequency of the carrier wave. To approximate the capacitance of a monopole, we can use this really complicated and annoying formula. Yeah, I'm just gonna plug that into an online calculator. The answer I got was about 6.5 picofarads for an 8 inch long antenna. To figure out what its impedance is, I plug in that value and the frequency and come out with over 23 kilo ohms. At 12 volts, that means I'm only pushing an average of half a milliamp. But how do I figure out my actual transmit power? To do that, we have to determine the equivalent resistance from radiation. This isn't an actual resistance, just an equivalent number that allows us to calculate radiated power using the familiar I squared R formula. Using this formula for a monopole antenna, I get about 0.4 milliohms. Doing these numbers comes out to an absolutely microscopic power of 10 to the minus 10 watts, or minus 70 dBm. A mouse farting probably has a larger electromagnetic disturbance than that. So how do I improve these numbers? The really easy first step is to just increase my antenna length, because my radiated power will increase with the square of the length. The trickier part, though extremely important, is to try and reduce the impedance of the antenna by trying to cancel out its capacitive reactance. For the purpose of calculating impedance, capacitive reactance is usually shown as negative and inductive reactance as positive. I'm going to add an inductor in series with the antenna and use this formula to calculate the required inductance to cancel out the capacitive reactance, which comes out to about 3.6 millihenries. Okay, so suppose I've added that exact amount of inductance and brought the impedance to practically zero. I have my transistors limited to a maximum of 0.2 amps, so assuming the antenna impedance is perfectly balanced, in an absolute best case, I only come out with about 0.015 milliwatts of radiated power, or minus 18 dBm. This is still extremely small, yet more than 100,000 times more radiated power than the case where the antenna wasn't impedance matched. So the bottom line is, you'll improve your range by making your antenna longer and correctly matching its impedance. Now there was no way I was going to perfectly match my antenna's impedance with a single inductor, so I started building a coil that I could use as a variable inductor, which is exactly the same thing you see in an old-fashioned crystal radio, sometimes called a foxhole radio. 
The difference is that instead of varying my inductance to selective frequency to listen to, I'd use it to optimize my output power on a fixed frequency. While I was at it, I decided I'd mount everything on a slab of stained wood using brown filament for my 3D printed parts to give the classic look of a radio from the late 1800s. I also replaced the 8 inch wire antenna with a 4 foot piece of copper tubing. Here I'm using a sheet of aluminum as a ground plane, and you're hearing the sound of the receiver sitting at the end of the driveway about 20 yards away. One really interesting thing I noticed was that I could adjust the power output if I moved my hand close to the antenna. If I touched it, there was almost no signal at all. My guess is that my body's proximity to the antenna changes its capacitance, and when that happens, it becomes detuned from the loading coil and the impedance goes way up. But if I held my hand in just the right spot, there was a big jump in signal strength. After lengthening my antenna and matching the impedance with the tuning coil, I got a loud and clear signal over 70 feet away. That's a huge improvement over the two feet I started with. The next thing I tried was adding a top hat to the antenna. This increases the effective length of the antenna without making it taller, and it should increase my transmit range. I also connected the low side of the transmitter to earth. The grounding rod is really short, and the ground is really sandy here, so it might not be a very good ground, but it's worth trying. This time, I got over 200 feet of transmit range, a 100-fold improvement over the first test. The last thing I did was replace the oscillator capacitors to produce a higher frequency. This should give me more radiated power with the same length antenna. The new frequency was 1.62 MHz, and this time I used my truck's radio to listen in. The signal isn't quite as strong, but it's still intelligible at this distance. When I measured on Google Earth, it turned out to be a little over 100 yards, so I think that's a good place to stop this experiment. Here's the final schematic I ended up with for the whole system. A linear regulator provides a steady 9 volts for the oscillator, and I added these capacitors to filter out the noise caused by the RF. Then I've got my oscillator, the oscillator amplifier, tone generator, main amp, loading coil, and finally the antenna. I should also point out these resistors that I didn't mention before which I put in to bias the transistors to get the turn-on thresholds I wanted from them. And here's the final results. At 1.03 MHz, I got 0.27 milliwatts of output power and 60 yards of range. At 1.62 MHz, I got nearly triple that amount at 0.72 milliwatts and 100 yards of range. As a final word, I should mention that this radio was an experiment for demonstration purposes, and it was only operated to make this video. Radio transmissions are regulated in most countries, and if you don't know what you're doing, you could be interfering with some other people's reception and get yourself in trouble with regulating agencies. If you're really interested in broadcasting with a radio, consider getting a ham radio license and operating on one of the amateur bands. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.